But anyway. I, I hope you recognize this man here. This man is, believe it or not, Luciano Gattinoni, 1977. And the guitar is an important component of the scientific evolution of Luciano. So he showed, together with Colobo, that mechanical ventilation can be decreased in parallel with the amount of CO2 removed by the membrane lung. And as you see that with mechanical ventilation, it is really a straight line. The more CO2 you remove, the less you have to ventilate. If you remove the entire CO2 production, you can go to apnea and breathe, ventilate your animal at the rate you want with the tidal volume you want. We apply this concept very soon to ARDS patients and at low frequency, two to four breaths per minute, 1980. To prevent barotrauma and the systemic derangement due to mechanical ventilation. We did not yet know the term biotrauma that came later from Toronto. Now, you have seen this slide already, but it's just to show that besides frequency, you, clinically you can decrease also tidal volume. You can decrease tidal volume, decrease plateau pressure, hence decreasing the ventilator-induced lung injury risk in any individual patient, maintaining a normal PCO2 and a normal pH. But we do not care, we do not take care of blood gases with CO2 removal. We take care of the ventilator-induced lung injury risk. The target is minimize the risk maintaining normal blood gases as much as possible. Now we talk about dry, spontaneous breathing, because with mechanical ventilation, a neuromuscular blocking agent is easy. You see, this is in a normal, she in normal sheep, there is the increase in CO2 removal plotted against decrease in minute ventilation. And as you can see, the line is, little, is more dispersed than with mechanical ventilation. Because ventilation, spontaneous ventilation is regulated by the brain and there's many other influences besides blood gases. But anyway, still, you can, in, a normal, in normal animals, you can fit a pretty good straight line. You want to decrease the ventilation of the animal, you increase the CO2 removal. If you do not frighten the sheep, or you do not terrorize the ship, she will keep breathing at very slow rate. Now, we tried this concept of control of respiratory drive in patients undergoing ECMO during the recovery phase when the uh, blood gas when the function of the lung was improving. And we could show that we could apply pressure support or CPAP in patients recovering from ARDS and they followed the same physiological line of the normal experimental animals. Uh, you see the uh, patients uh, uh, going from ECMO to partial CO2 removal. Their minute ventilation went down from 14 to 10. The 
tidal volume from 449 to 382, respiratory rate from 32 to 27, PCO2 went down from 45 to 41. So if we remove CO2, they go to an almost normal respiratory rate from 32 to, 20 to 27, they decrease the immune ventilation. And this is a plot of a single patient showing you, this is a very old graph, as you can see. And you see that when the, VC, the CO2 removal with, by the membrane landing, lung increases, the CO2 eliminated by the natural lung goes down. So it's easy. You want to control the respiratory drive? You remove more CO2 and the patient will be more peaceful, will decrease rate and tidal volume. This is more recent, 2016. We even have electromyography of the diaphragm, tidal volume, esophageal pressure. And you see that when we stop the gas flow on the ECMO machine, the esophageal pressure drop increases very much, the electromyography increases, the tidal volume increases, and the transpulmonary pressure increases very much. Look here. Because the tidal volume goes up. Again, this is when we have 100%, if, you, if we cut down the gas flow from up on the membrane lung from 100% to 50%, 25%, 0%, that is close the gas flow, gas flow, you see the tidal volume goes up from 4.7 milliliters per kilo to higher than 6. Same is true from the pressure developed by the muscles of the patient. The work, the respiratory work, can be controlled by the gas flow of the membrane lung. Respiratory drive is measured by PO1. What PO1 is the drop in pressure that the patient causes if you make him breathe against an occluded airway. To make it understandable, you push the button of the end expiratory pose. The patient tries to breathe, but the valve is closed and the pressure drops in the airways. You measure how much this, the drop is in the first 100 milliseconds, that is before the brain on the, of the patient realizes that the airway is closed, and that will tell you how much effort the patient is going to put into the next breath, is going, was willing to put into the next breath. And you see that the drive of the patient, once again, goes down, the more so, the more you close the gas flow. Sorry, the more you open the gas flow. <sighs> I showed you a wonderful picture that controlling drive is very easy. It's very easy in COPD patients in almost all COPD patients, as well, as well as the, the data I've just shown you in recovering ARDS patients. But if you look at a severe ARDS patient in the acute phase, then the line is not as good as I've just shown you. Because the respiratory drive of, a, of severe ARDS is very high. And it's very difficult to control the drive just by changing the blood gases. Again, I've been telling you that in normal animals, in normal subjects, in patients recovering from ARDS, or in COPD patients, you control the respiratory drive by controlling PCO2. In severe ARDS patients, that is problematic 
because the stimuli that run the respiratory drive are not just blood gases. It's lung edema, it's stiffness of the chest, decreased lung volume. Look at this severe ARDS patient. He's still on day seven, he's one of those patients that Alain Combe was refer referring to. We stopped paralysis, he started to breathe. And look, he's, he's still very sick, obviously. And the esophageal pressure swing is more than 30 centimeters of water. The transpulmonary pressure is very high, in the 40s. And he's making this with his own muscles. Is called, we have called it patient self-inflicted lung injury. It's a complicated term to say that a strong effort in, during spontaneous breathing can damage the lung. And unfortunately, we cannot control it by controlling blood gases. gases. As you know, severe RDS patients are tachypnoic. Their PCO2 is sometimes kind of low. Their pH initially might even be on the alkalotic side because their respiratory drive is very high. Thomas Langer, one from our group of Mil in Milan, went to Texas to study sick sheep. And they, they in the laboratory of Dr. Baczynski, they studied a model of ARDS, and they caused ARDS in sheep. And you can see that while nor in normal sheep, by increasing CO2 removal, tidal volume goes down. In sheep, in this ARDS model in sheep, you increase the gas flow, you increase the CO2 removal, but tidal volume just starts to change when you reach 100%. And that is once again because the respiratory drive of an animal, including humans, with the R severe RDS is not controlled just by blood gases. We all would like to have awake patients in ECMO, eating ice creams, but in this study performed by my colleagues in Milan, you can see that while you can extubate in ECMO the majority of, the pa of COPD patients, the majority of patients being bridged to transplant, only eight patients out of 30 could be extubated under ECMO. And of those eight, 50% had to be reintubated because the respiratory drive was so high. And these patients that could not tolerate spontaneous breathing were the sickest with the more heavier lungs, more lung, higher lung edema, lower PO2s, in a word, sicker. So in conclusion, CO2 removal controls the, controls the respiratory drive in, norm, in normal animals. It controls the respiratory drive in COPD patients. It controls the respiratory drive in ARDS patients that are improving when they are no longer severe ARDS patients. But controlling the respiratory drive when, patient, when in the RD, very severe ARDS patients requires something different and even sub-pharmacologic, sub-therapeutic doses of neuromuscular blocking agents. And by that, I think I'm finished. Yes. Thank you, Antonio, for this beautiful presentation and alluding to the importance of uh, drive in uh, 
patients with uh, IRDS. Uh, I think this is relevant because a uh, drive uh, can be uh, easily or relatively easy. Can you hear me or? No, no, I hear, but I don't see you, so. Okay, but uh, well, I, di I didn't change. <laughs> no, but I read the, I read the lips, no. you know. I don't so, understand English too well. Um, uh, so, Jody looks so, still the same. So the thing is that uh, drive can be uh, easily measured in patients intubated, mechanically ventilated, not with P1 maneuver. Uh, my point is, uh, how do you recommend to measure this in patients uh, under sedation or in patients uh, without any sedative? And uh, if you have uh, an estimate, because uh, you know uh, we like numbers, if you have uh, an estimate of uh, a drive that uh, is to be uh, well, completely uh, abolished. As you, as you know, Jordi, the respiratory drive can be influenced by uh, sedation. Even if in severe RDS patients, you, you must get to coma, a real coma to, to, to suppress most of the respiratory drive, not entirely. So I think, and you know also that in RDS patients, often assisted breathing is coupled to some degree of sedation. I think the, that, as you hinted, PO1 requires a respiratory drive because if you suppress the drive, you cannot measure it. Uh, the estimate of to, what we, what I suggest is that uh, you should evaluate the patient pathophysiology before waking him up, that is compliance, shunt, and that's the most of it. A very low compliance usually goes together with a very high drive. If I'm allowed to add something, um, Jordi, so Roberta Costa was looking at opioids to control the respiratory drive, and she made with a low dose of remifentanil um, a very interesting observation. So it did not at all influence the pressure, pressure swing. So the effort with each breath stayed the same while using an opioid, but the frequency was reduced. There was a longer pause between each breath. So obviously, very obviously, the only chance to influence the, the drive in a sense of reducing the muscular force is using a neuromuscular blocker. Antonio, it's hard. Can you see me? I see you. <laughs> uh, can I ask? I must confess, I recognize your voice. What, what do you think the mechanism is for the increased drive? Do you think it's central or is it peripheral to the receptors? Because if it's if it's central, if it's peripheral, you might be able to give inhaled, you know, agonist or blockers that actually decrease sensitivity, and that's been done in many experimental situations. So it might be something to do. I know an ARDS won't be so easy, but. It's a possibility. Uh, you know, there are, I, I think the two major candidates are J receptors yeah. in the lung, yeah. and the other one is somehow connected to the vagal system, yeah. vagal, vagal, whatever. But, uh, but they're, they're the same. I mean, those receptors act via the vagus, right? But anticholinergic drugs do not work. Now I'm thinking of bupivacaine, something you inhale that could actually block the receptors. I, I'm not aware of this kind of experiments. And I cannot understand the physiological literature on um, mechanical control of breathing because it's very complicated and species dependent. So... Do you know if... Uh transplanted lungs with ARDS behave uh, similarly? I'm afraid I cannot answer this question, but perhaps somebody on the floor can tell us. That's a very good point. Mm. Yeah. Um, I cannot tell you really, perhaps can you or Ricarda, do, do, do you remember any experience with our transplanted patients in VV ECMO post-transplant? Because 
This is a, this is a strange situation. No, I, I don't remember any specific patient. I can tell you that there are observations, for example, using uh, NAVA in transplant patients, uh, looking at the relationship between tidal volume and EDI. And the assumption was that, you know, in NAVA, tidal volume should be regulated by the feedback between the EDI and the signals, which are, should be mediated by vulgar receptors. <coughs> So the, the assumption was that in, in transplanted patients, the lung is denervated, so they should lose this thing. But apparently, what they saw in that experiment, that there's a, le a letter published in the Blue Journal, that in NAVA, the control of tidal volume was still related to the total lung capacity of the, of the transplanted lung. So they concluded that even if they don't have the if the, the lung is denervated, there must be some other vagal receptors, vagal <coughs> inputs from, let's say, proprioceptors of, of the chest wall that can still control by reflex the, the, the inflation of the lung. So uh, that's the theory that the chest senses the stiff lung. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. It's actually something which might uh, be the uh, topic and the, uh, of the subject of uh, future studies. Very interesting point. Thank you so much.